Hello everyone, I'm Dr Paul Rose and in this short presentation I'd like to explain how much is there to know about one species when it comes to zoo animal husbandry and evidence for management regimes. I hope we're all familiar with flamingos. They're a real zoo staple and one of the commonest of zoo housed birds. But how we keep them and their management regimes can sometimes be based on relatively sketchy ecological evidence. I'm right in the thick of a flock of Chilean flamingos here, and this looks like a real spectacle for the public, but is it best for the birds? Now I've moved to a flock of captive Caribbean flamingos in this more naturalistic saline lagoon. I'm further away from the animals, but what they're provided with might be better for them. This talk was originally presented at the 2020 Virtual Biosa Research Conference. It aims to explain why science and evidence is key to how we manage even the most familiar of species in captivity. My name is Dr Paul Rose and I am the Vice Chair of the Biosa Research Committee and I'm also the Co-Chair of the IUCN Species Survival Commission's Flamingo Specialist Group. And I think it will become clear from my talk today that flamingos are incredibly central to what I do as a scientist. I am a lecturer in animal behaviour at the University of Exeter, and I'm a research associate at the Wild Fowler Wetlands Trust. And it's my WWT hat that I'm wearing today, because it's through that organisation that I get to help chair the flamingo specialist group. So what I would like to talk to you about is just how much is there to know about one species? And as you'll find out from my talk, I'm actually talking about a group of species, but what I'd like to illustrate is the way in which we can do research on familiar to the zoo species, where we still might have knowledge gaps in our information about them. So the basis for this talk is where does husbandry evidence come from to help us advance animal care? So a brief introduction to what I'm going to talk about. I'd like to give you some ideas on where we fill our knowledge gaps that are useful for the zoo. Where do we fill the knowledge gaps in husbandry and management for the species we keep? I'd then like to talk about why do I specifically investigate flamingos? What is the knowledge gain that we can get from science that involves the pink birds? I'm going to give you an example of how we do that based on setting out key research priorities. So how can we structure a research programme to answer particular questions where we know we have sketchy information on what we need to provide the birds with. I'll give you two case studies that are examples of current science that I'm involved in. One that's on the friendships that flamingos have within their flocks and one that's on a very practical aspect of daily flamingo husbandry. How does the feeding schedule of the birds influence some of the behaviours that they perform? Then I will end with a brief explanation of where is all of this science going in the future. Zoos are excellent places to undertake scientific research. And over the past 18 months to two years, we've seen a raft of new papers that have come out that shows the extent, the depth and breadth of scientific output from zoos and aquariums. And most of this has a direct application to developing animal care. So that's really, really nice to see the extent to which the zoo community is investing in gaining knowledge that is really useful to how it keeps its animal populations. And one of the reasons that I really like doing research in the zoo is just how far that can disseminate and how many people can find that research useful. And one of my really nice examples of this is how the husbandry knowledge that we have in the zoo is not only useful to ex situ populations, those in captivity, but also those out in the wild. So husbandry developments for our ex situ animals can directly translate into field conservation initiatives. And I have a reference here from Andrew Greenwood from the mid 1990s. And he talks about the role of the zoo vet in um, the successful conservation of threatened bird species. And this is something very close to my heart because being at the Wild Fauna Wetlands Trust, I have seen firsthand some of their conservation success stories that have been based on research and investigation of husbandry required for bird conservation 
that is based on ex situ models which have then been applied to the field. So things like the critically endangered Madagascar potchard or spoonbilled sandpiper, those projects would not have been successful without those husbandry models that were used in captive collections then applied to the field. And the more that we undertake zoo animal science that tells us about the way in which we're caring for the animals and allows us to evaluate it and reassess it. So the more we can move away from outdated, potentially not that relevant, domestic or agricultural models that are far too generic and probably based around production outputs rather than the outputs that we need the animals to give in the modern zoo, the educational and the conservation outputs of these captive collections. So when we come to think about how do we assess captive care, where can we start? Where can we start to gain evidence from? Well, in my head, one of the best places to start is in the wild. Now, I know when it comes to attaining positive welfare and a good quality of life, the performance of natural behaviour is not the be all and end all, but it's a very good place to start. There's an excellent paper by Howell and colleagues that looks at the application of wild ecology knowledge on primates to how we understand primate welfare in captivity. So long as we are aware of what we're doing, of what information we're using and how that information is being collected, it's an excellent starting point to evidence the way in which these species should be kept in the zoo. That leads me nicely into talking about why flamingos are fabulous. And I'm now going to convince you all as to why they are such amazing animals. So on this slide, I've got examples of the flamingo's natural habitat, as well as the distribution map that shows beautifully in pink where you find flamingos around the world. Whilst flamingos are known for existing in really huge flocks, like you can see in the photo of the lesser flamingos at the top of the slide, they're actually very restricted in the areas of the world that you find them. And they're incredibly specialised to a handful of particular wetlands. That makes flamingos really at risk of climatic change and human encroachment. Consequently, there's conservation and educational benefits of the flamingos that we have in the zoo. So the fact that I can talk about flamingos to you today and explain a bit about their habitats means I can use one of my favourite biological words. Flamingos are extremophiles. They are birds evolved to live in incredibly inhospitable, incredibly harsh environments. And I've illustrated that with the two photos at the bottom of the slide. The slide on the bottom left is of Lake Bagoria and one of the hot springs that feeds the lake. And you can see this hot spring is erupting out of, out of the ground. And that water is at near boiling point. So these flamingos have to cope with incredibly high temperatures. The next photo along is of Lake Natron. And you can see that the lake is stained a kind of pinky red colour by the salts in the water and also the algae that the flamingos feed on. And this combination of algae and salts make this a very toxic environment that other animals simply can't live in. And I have an example of just how toxic this environment is. This is a book by a chap called Leslie Brown that was written in the 1950s. And it is an account of his adventures to go and find the breeding and feeding grounds of the lesser flamingos in East Africa. And it contains some amazing black and white photos of this expedition to go and find the birds. It also contains some incredibly horrific descriptions of what happens to the human body when you wade out into one of these caustic soda lakes. Very interesting reading. Now, I'm not suggesting that we create a toxic soda lake that is going to do you horrific harm in the zoo, because that's not going to be good for anybody, especially the zookeepers. But we should think about how we display the flamingos to a zoo's visitors, because that ultimately affects the message that is shown by the birds in captivity. So on this slide, I have an example at top left of some captive Caribbean flamingos in the zoo enclosure, and I have some wild Caribbean flamingos out in the field. And I hope you can see that the zoo enclosure mimics quite beautifully the natural environment. There's very little difference in the type of setup we have between the zoo and the wild. And that really showcases the flamingo's adaptations and how it lives its life. That is one of the rarer examples of a naturalistic flamingo exhibit. We seem to have this viewpoint that the flamingo is this tropical Garden of Eden bird that occurs in this wonderful lush environment 
where we have lots of green foliage, beautiful planting, manicured lawns and lots of pretty flowers. And this is simply not the case of the types of environments that the flamingo naturally occurs in. Yes, it looks beautiful and yes, it's very appealing to the eye. But if we're going to really explain the message of the flamingo as this extremophile, of this incredibly hardy, wonderfully adapted bird to these remarkable wetlands, we need to remove the beautiful planting, remove the manicured lawn, and think about how we can use a bit of ecologically driven design in the style of our flamingo enclosures to really show off the remarkable environments that they come from. So how do we get this evidence into practice then? How do we understand what we need to do and how do we understand what we don't necessarily know to ensure that our flamingo management is up to scratch? So I'm now going to tell you a way in which that we have designed a research programme around particular questions that we've needed to answer to further evidence flamingo husbandry. So I said at the start that my talk was about how much is there to know about one species when actually I'm talking about six species and this is the six species of flamingo. So I'm just going to very briefly go through them for you starting at the bottom left. So with the very very bright yellow beak that's the James's or Puna flamingo, the South American species, very uncommonly seen in captivity. And above that bird with another yellow and black beak we have got the Andean flamingo, Again, incredibly specialised South American species, not commonly seen in captivity. And those two species together are probably the poorest understood of all of the flamingos. In fact, the James's flamingo was thought to be extinct until the 1950s. We've then got the four species of flamingo that we do see more often in captivity. The Crimson Caribbean flamingo is next. Above that bird, we've got the very small lesser flamingo. Then above me, We've got the greater flamingo, which is the palest and the largest species. And above the greater flamingo, we have got the Chilean flamingo with its distinctive pink joints on grey legs. And it's the Caribbean, greater and Chilean flamingo that we most often see in captivity. So we know there are different flamingo species out there. We know they have these different uh, morphologies, different ways of doing things. And whilst they have ecological differences to them, we can use a broad brush approach of looking at husbandry change that could benefit all of these six species together. So what do I mean by this broad brush approach? Well, it's looking at the flamingos collectively, seeing what we know about them, seeing what we don't know about them, and then trying to answer those questions to fill in those husbandry gaps. And this was published back in 2014 in the International Zoo Yearbook. My colleagues and I, including the current at the time chair of the Flamingo Specialist Group, Rebecca Lee, we reviewed the literature that was available to help advance flamingo welfare knowledge. And we produced a table in this paper that set out questions that we needed to answer to direct research to understand more about the care of flamingos in zoos. So this is that table. And I appreciate that it looks quite messy and you probably can't read it properly. So I'm going to break down the core elements of it for you. So starting at the very top, we've got overall positive welfare state. How can we attain knowledge of best practice flamingo husbandry that allows us to give the birds the best quality of life in the zoo? Where does this knowledge of overall positive welfare states come from? And we thought one of the things that we could do was a comparative approach. Can we look at the wild, see what the flamingo is doing in the wild? and then look at captivity and what the flamingo does there. And these comparative approaches is something that you'll find in the scientific literature. And if you're interested to know more, then I would direct you to the work of Georgia Mason, who has some really, really excellent papers on the comparative approach used to further enhance our understanding of animal welfare. So that's our overall gain uh, for this paper. How do we get to that gain? We can split that down by various specific questions, which I've listed here. Could we look at foot health, plumage colour, flock sizes that we keep the birds in, the friendships, the social bonds they have, how do we feed them, the style of enclosure we provide, and how that impacts on things like population sustainability and breeding. We could also look at novel areas of science, such as what do the birds do when their keepers go home? What is their nocturnal activity? And then we could look at some contentious issues, 
such as flight restraint and the aviary styles that we're building for our flamingos? Does it actually allow a full range of movement in the birds that we're keeping? So by listing these questions, by explaining what the objective is and then what the output of that question might be, we can pick what question we're answering that allows us to then further advance that area of flamingo husbandry. Here are my two example case studies that I've taken from that table. One of them is looking at the social bonds that occur in flamingo flocks, and we've been looking at this over a number of years now. And the other is looking at the impact of a particular type of husbandry, i.e. food provision, on the behaviour that the birds do. And these can be behavioural indicators that we could take forward to look at animal welfare state. So for the flamingo friendships, uh, we know that social networks show the importance of the choice of associate that the flamingo has within its group. These birds are very specific in who they'll spend their time with, and they will actively avoid conspecifics within their flocks. So consequently, flamingos need to be provided with a choice to mix non-randomly. And one of the reasons that I performed this research was to provide um, support for the minimum number of birds that we need to keep in a flock. So flamingos have evolved to live in large groups, and therefore they get a benefit from being with many others. And we seem to have shown that in this research. A flamingo social network is obviously a very complex structure and worthy of further investigation. So we should enable this social choice to occur in captivity. This paper also shows that long-term data sets are really useful for tracking changes in sociality over time. And social network analysis really lends itself to deeper investigation of why social bonds are important in the zoo. In the 2019 BIOS of Research Conference, we had a whole workshop on social network analysis, and hopefully that showed to any delegates that were there the usefulness and relevance of this methodological uh, way of understanding social relationships to practical animal husbandry. And what is the practical application of this? Well, it tells us who we can move around and who we should move with them. And therefore, we can base our flamingo flock structures on the outputs of network analysis. And again, one of the things that I really like about working at WWT is that flamingo moves that have happened whilst this network analysis has been taking place have been done based on the results of the Flamingo Friendships project. So we can actually use it to inform who we should keep behind in their stable groupings and who are the more social butterfly flamingos that we could move elsewhere. Then with the Feeding Styles project, we have looked at the more artificial styles of how we feed our flamingos, i.e. in a more restricted area, compared to a more naturalistic setting when the flamingos can forage over a wider period of time. And this was my uh, MSc student, Laura Sewell, who looked at videos of foraging lesser flamingos, and she compared the time spent foraging to the time spent being aggressive. And not only did she find differences between the type of foraging location that the birds were in on the foraging time and the aggression time, but she also found individual differences based on the bird's plumage colour as well. And this showed that individual characteristics of the birds within a social group are influencing the behaviour of others around them. So the practical application of this is really relevant to husbandry. If you feed your flamingos in a more natural setting where they can forage over a wider area, you'll have more time spent foraging and less time spent on aggression. That to me has animal welfare benefits, but it also has potential logistic benefits as well. For example, are you less likely to waste flamingo pellets if you feed it in a wider area when the birds are going to spend more time consuming it and less time squabbling over it? Just a thought there that we could potentially take further. To finish, where do we go in the future? Of the six species of flamingo, three occur commonly in captivity. One occurs infrequently in captivity, and two are kept by very, very few animal collections. Of these six flamingo species, not all of them have self-sustaining captive populations, yet they're very commonly housed, and they're very popular. So whilst people love them, whilst their husbandry is not that difficult, we still have to advance their population management. And I know there is current work out there, my colleagues in mine, that are looking into the use of records and how we can use zoo records to understand just what flamingos need to breed more successfully in the zoo. And hopefully that kind of information can be applied into captive care 
to sort out some of the challenges that we face with these birds and to promote some of the positive aspects of their life in the zoo. So the flamingo is an excellent ambassador for wetland conservation. It's something that is a real vivid example of evolution at a very refined scale. It's a colonial breeder with very specific habitat requirements. It has these amazing pink feathers that have evolved through a range of different social constructs. It can tell zoo visitors a lot about climate change, about the threats to the natural world from human activities. So it's important that we continue to strive with our scientific research into these familiar species because we still have many unanswered questions about them to fully enhance their lives in the zoo. And there are some excellent examples out there of really, really good flamingo care. I'm very privileged to research these birds at the Royal Family Wetlands Trust and to work with a group of people that implement the outputs of scientific research, like I've talked about with the lesser flamingos, to enhance the bird's quality of life in captivity. I hope you've enjoyed this talk. Thank you very much for listening. If you'd like to know more about some of the pieces of research that I've talked about, you can find them in my reference list. But it's really important to remember that science is only as good as the audience that it reaches. So if you are a student, if you're somebody involved in scientific research, with the permission of whoever you've been working with, work with them to write up and disseminate your research, because ultimately that will be of most benefit to other scientists, but to the animals as well. Thank you.